What's up guys, it's Bromley at Empire Barbell. Today we're gonna go a little bit more in depth into how to program for your deadlift. So what I have illustrated here, pretty crude illustration of a Jack gentleman at the bottom position of a deadlift. What I wanted to highlight is how we can separate your deadlift training into two different parts. People usually think of the movement pattern as kind of one thing and it's not entirely true. Everything above the waist is responsible for one job and everything below the waist is responsible for another. People are going to fail or struggle based on different weaknesses. So if you have somebody who struggles because they can't get above a certain percentage without having a severe fold in their back, without losing integrity in their midsection or their upper back, that's gonna be an entirely different approach to fix that than if you have somebody who simply can't break the weight off the ground or has a, a nasty stick point right below the knee. So it's very important to be aware of the difference between these two types of issues and how to plan ahead and how to attack them when they pop up. So it's very important to be aware of these two different issues. It's not, the wisdom isn't just get stronger. So it's really important to understand the difference between these two things. So when you're troubleshooting your deadlift or when you're trying to program for somebody with specific issues, it will help you to get a little bit better at pinpointing exactly what the issue is and what the best way to go about is to fixing that issue. So pretty much everything above the waistline, we're gonna put in the camp of stability related. When you execute a deadlift, most of the movement is gonna be a hip hinge. We're just moving at the hip joint. Well, if you hinge correctly, everything from that point up should be locked down and braced. You shouldn't be rounding and arching. You shouldn't be moving around. There should be no real give. The muscles around your spine are designed specifically to limit movement so that your body can move, so that you can run, jump, throw a punch, and stay braced and tight because that's efficient. It's not only efficient, it's what's gonna keep you safe. It's what's gonna keep your vertebra intact. So if we go off that premise that everything above the waist is designed to brace, then we're looking at your abdominals, your obliques, your erectors, even the muscles of your upper back. They're all designed to contract isometrically to stay rigid as you move at the hip joint. So when you deadlift, you know, people say all the time, you know, don't lift with your back. You can't lift with your back. Or if you are lifting with your back, you're doing some type of horrible, like uncoiling at the spine using your erectors, like some cobra coming out of a basket. That's entirely incorrect. As long as your back is straight, you're not lifting with your back. So if you're pitched over in this position and these muscles are doing their job, your upper back, your erectors, your obliques, your abdominals, if they're doing their job, they're clamped down. That's it. So your spine should be like a steel effing rod right there, okay? Straight line, no give, and that's entirely based on how well, how well these muscles clamp down. Now what initiates the pull off the ground is gonna be the muscles of the hips, and actually the muscles of the knee. The quadriceps play a pretty big role, but we're mainly gonna concern ourselves with the hip hinging action. So depending on your build, there may be kind of a, a push into hip extension, in which case the quads are gonna be responsible for driving your feet through the ground. For people with longer legs or people that tend to set their hips a bit higher, you're gonna look at almost a pure hip hinge where the hamstrings are, are more responsible for breaking the, the weight off the ground than the quadriceps. Either way, the hip is kind of the center point for movement, okay? We're looking at this rigid uh, spine, right? Your torso is rigid. And what physically levers your spine up to a vertical position are your glutes and hamstrings, okay? Every time we look at a hip extension under a load, the glutes and hamstrings are gonna be the big movers that drive your hip in. When you add more bend to the knee, now you're talking about the quadriceps being involved. So again, they're, they're gonna be involved in different proportion based on how deep you squat at the start of your deadlift. Let's say that you have an issue with stability. Let's say that your upper back tends to go, that you have a hard time keeping your lats locked down, that you tend to feel a lot of pressure in your spine and your lower back when you pull. So that's a bracing issue, all right? It's not a matter of arching more. It's not a matter of getting your legs stronger. You could have all the horsepower in the world in your legs and hips, but if you cannot support that through your midsection and your upper back, you're gonna run into a problem, right? Uh, I, I draw a lot of parallels to arm wrestling. Arm wrestling is very similar for any of you that know anything about it. You could have the absolute strongest shoulder, strongest arm, uh, your bicep and tricep. I mean, from here down, you could just be locked in. But if you go against somebody who has stronger fingers than you and they wrench your wrist back, you can't maneuver with your wrist cocked back like that. So all somebody has to do is get your wrist back and then it doesn't matter how strong your arm is, you're going back, it's just leverage. 
Well, it's the exact same thing with your upper back. It does not matter how strong your legs and hips are. If you can't hold position here, then your upper back, it's like the limp wrist that's cocked back. Your upper back, you're not gonna be able to physically get your hips into the bar as efficiently. And that's gonna be the big point that causes you to miss deadlift. So working that bracing, you're talking about things that tax your upper back more. Uh, again, bracing, the key word is braced. You're isometrically contracted. So to get your abdominals stronger, I'm not gonna recommend a bunch of sit-ups or leg raises. I'm gonna recommend bracing type activities. Same thing for your upper back, same thing for your erectors and your obliques. So anything that stresses the upper back for uh, any period of time, for any, any significant amount of time under tension, uh, under a heavy load is gonna be ideal. Now, most of compound weightlifting type movements do that. Safety bar is probably the best tool for that because it puts the weight in front of you. So when you're holding the safety bar, you have to fight to keep from folding over. So one tip I got was really, really heavy partial safety bar box squats as a good way to build up the upper back. Typically, I'm not a fan of huge overload when it comes to bracing. You wanna learn how to position first, then work on endurance, and then you can work on heavy loads. I really like safety bar good mornings because the safety bar, again, shifts the weight out in front. So as you bend over, you're gonna feel a lot of that tension in your upper and mid back. So if you take a safety bar, if you go through a very slow, deep good morning, even if you pause at the bottom and then come up quickly, you're gonna feel in very short order how taxing it is on your upper back, even on your abdominals. If you practice on bracing the entire way, very, very slow and then back up. Uh, as the weight moves further down, so it's further down your body with a straight bar and even more so with a camber bar, that's gonna take pressure away from your torso. It's gonna put it more in your hips. So I really like safety bar for these movements to help get your upper back and your midsection strong. Um, bracing should be about maintaining perfect position. It should be about a lot of time under tension, right? And only once you get good at holding position with extended time under tension, do you then worry about load? Because if you get under a heavy weight that isolates your upper back or your midsection and you fold, it could be disastrous. Strict bent rows are another favorite of mine and nobody does these right. You see a lot of pendlay rows, you see a lot of shitty uh, swinging rows. That's not that they don't have value, but it's not appropriate for newer lifters. Most people do it just because you can throw an extra plate on the bar. Uh, it tends to be a little more wrapped up in ego than it does in solid uh, training foundations. So what I like to do with a bent row is get as absolutely bent over as I can where my back is flat and pull with absolutely no sway in my upper back. Now what that teaches you to do is to maintain a braced spine under a load. The weight's light so you can focus on maintaining position, but because you have this extra uh, dynamic aspect of the weight moving, you're having to brace as the weight moves, which is a little more challenging. So you don't need heavy loads. Fantastic upper back builder, just a bent row by itself. But the fact that you're bent over very steep and you're strict, it's a, it's a great way to get engagement in your abdominals, to figure out what a flat back looks like, and to really build a thick, strong back in the context of being bent over, which is what a deadlift requires anyways. Um, so for my upper back movements, I mean, safety bar good mornings, along with bent rows, I mean, that compounded with any type of deadlift movement you're doing in your training, it's gonna be most of what you need when it comes to getting an upper back that can handle a load. So as we come further down, we're looking at uh, the abdominals and the obliques. Again, we're looking at bracing. So it's either movements where you're holding isometrically or you're holding isometrically while you're moving. So good mornings actually hit a bit of that, especially if you do a really slow negative and focus on bracing. But I really like suitcase holds for the obliques. You can do suitcase walks as well. Ed Cohen was a big fan of these. It's literally grabbing a, a heavy dumbbell, farmer walk handle, barbell, whatever, standing up and just holding for time. And you're gonna feel very quickly that that opposite oblique is gonna be working double time to try and keep you in position. You're gonna progress very, very fast at them. And as you progress in weight, you should feel extra clamped down when you deadlift. So those are a great movement. Planks, a lot of you are probably surprised I'm throwing a plank up there. <clears throat> Most people don't plank correctly. Uh, if you plank and you can hold it all day, but you feel pressure in your lower back, that tells you that your abdominals are opened up and you can't squat heavy, you can't deadlift heavy like that. Even in this position, you can kind of see how the abdominals are pulled in a little bit, the ribs are down. That's what you want to think is ribs down. So when you're in a plank, 
Think about your ribs pulled into your pelvis, your abdominals tight. I should be able to come up and soccer kick you while you're in a plank and it should feel like my foot's hitting concrete. You wanna be ready and braced at all times in a plank to uh, really just sustain an immense amount of force, okay? That's how hard you wanna be squeezing. And when you do them right, they're gonna burn within about five seconds. So that's how you know you're doing it right. Only once you can hold that, and then once you can draw that hold out to 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a minute. If you can do a 45 second to a minute plank with good position, then you're ready to start adding weight. And once you can do it for an extended period of time with weight, then you can start doing rollouts. Then you can start doing more complex movements where this is maintaining position as you're moving out in, in different directions and through different modes of training. So planks, when done the right way, they're a fantastic way to get kind of receptivity in your midsection. So you can actually feel your abdominals at play and know how they're working, how they're supposed to be working uh, while you're deadlifting. Because if you don't feel your abs right before you pull, you're setting yourself up for an injury. All of the belt tension in the world won't make up for abdominals that are dead. Um, so since we kind of covered bracing and there's a million exercises that will do this in some capacity. I mean, you'll see people recommend, you know, seated good mornings around back good mornings, which, which hammer the upper back pretty well. Those are things I don't have a lot of experience with. There's any upper back movement, really any crock rows. Again, you're talking about moving. You're talking about maintaining a stable spine while moving and while moving a, a shit ton of weight. Obviously they build a thick upper back and the extra dynamic of the anti-rotation of trying to, of being off centered with one heavy dumbbell as you row, that does wonders for your midsection. So there's plenty of variations. These are just a couple ideas that I like to incorporate to try and reinforce, especially this has been a big problem for me because I have a longer torso, history of lower back injuries. Stability up top is huge. It's 10 times more important than how strong your, your legs actually are. So now we go into the main movers. If you want a big pull, you need a violent explosion in your hips. You need to be able to physically extend under a heavy load. So for someone who has, let's say a shorter torso or otherwise is very, very stable. If you see somebody who can pull a limit max effort deadlift and fail and their back does not round at all, they need a lot less of this. They need a lot more of this. You know, you're talking about the motor getting stronger. The structural stuff is intact. Now we need a stronger motor to actually get more power on the bar. I like camber bar good mornings. The difference is between a camber bar and a safety bar. A camber bar, because the weight's hanging down, you can physically pull it back. So now the weights are closer to your hips. If you do a good morning with a camber bar and those weights are back to your hips, you're gonna feel nothing in your back. You're gonna feel it all in your hips. So it's a really great way to build hip extension. Uh, you can go a little bit heavier. I see Burley Hawk do those all the time with like 800 pounds. Um, it's a fantastic lift. That's become one of my favorite deadlift accessories. Box squats are another good one. Again, coming down, doing it right, not swinging and running back up quickly, but trying to come down, practice, uh, come into a dead stop, release your hips, and then fire up quickly. As you get quicker and stronger off the box, you're gonna notice that the weight is gonna jump off the ground in a deadlift. Box squats, I've always noticed like a one-to-one -one carryover. When my box squat's good, my deadlift is good. Uh, side handle deadlifts, you don't see so much. Now, I don't like really low trap bar deadlifts, I prefer elevated to where my hands are either at my knee or a little bit below my knee. But what a side handle deadlift does is it puts the weight in your center of mass, just like a cambered bar good morning does. The problem with a deadlift is the weight's out in front. So you have this, this moment arm, right, between your hips and the weight because the weight's out in front. By having the side handle, you roll the weight back where it's in line with your hips. And it's a really good way to practice scooping your hips through because you can practice that before the bar would otherwise be in the way, if that makes sense. With a straight bar, you have to wait till the bar's over your knees to run your hips through. With a uh, side handle deadlift, you don't, so you can run your hips through faster. So that, you do a, a, like in a strong mammy, heavy car deadlift, something for reps. I mean, it's not just your glutes, it's your glutes, it's your hamstrings. Everything in your hips just feels like it got taken out, rode hard and left out wet. But that really gives you insight on how much demand it puts directly on your hips and how much carryover it gets. My lockout, my you know, powerlifting legal lockout, not my strongman hitch, got insanely strong from doing really heavy side handle deadlifts, trying to do heavy farmer walks and heavy car deadlifts because I got really good at cranking my hips into the handles as quick as I could and my glutes just exploded. So if you have the opportunity, side handle deadlift, uh, done for you know, any amount of reps. I, I would recommend at least one balls out set of 12 to 15 reps, especially if it's at a, a partial height. 
you can get most of your working sets between five and eight reps, and you're gonna benefit immensely from those if hip power is something you're lagging in. Um, and then Romanian deadlifts. Romanian deadlifts are probably my favorite because you can train them more often. They're a lot less taxing than a regular deadlift. You can use lighter weight, but you're still practicing on bracing. It really emphasizes, I mean, the big one with the Romanian is just focusing on bracing hips back, hips forward, hips back, hips forward. So it really isolates that hinge that's gonna be really the backbone of your deadlift to begin with. Now, one of the reasons Romanians are probably the king of deadlift accessory movements as far as I'm concerned, is you can train them in a hypertrophy range, you can train them more often. Uh, you're also training bracing because you should be locked in, perfect posture, coming down slow, 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 and then driving your hips through. So we get the added benefit of time under tension for your upper back, for your midsection, and again, if you do them right and you're braced and you're moving under the slow negative, your abs are gonna be on fire. So that gives that receptivity that you can later look for when you're at the bottom of a heavy deadlift to lock in right before you pull. But the uh, work that it does on the hips are huge. I mean, if you do a reasonably controlled negative for six, eight, 10 reps, something with a, a nice slow controlled Romanian, your hammies and glutes should just be destroyed afterwards. So. The Romanians, far and away, probably one of my favorite deadlift exercises that nobody does, nobody does right. They're hard, you know, they, you're underweight for a long time, you have to be controlled for a long time. You can't just let the weight rock it to the ground after every rep because you just want to pull it and then give up on life. So incorporate Romanians, uh, you know, at least once a week, right after you do your heavy pulling. You can even alternate, you do them after you squat, you know, on a second lower body day. But that's a fantastic exercise. So these are just some broad ideas. I can give a little more, uh, a little more detail. The safety bar, good mornings. Uh, anything that is really heavy on your upper back is gonna take a long time to recover from. I wouldn't do those more than once a week. Uh, the reps, I would keep kind of middle ground. I wouldn't go super, super heavy. Again, you're focused on posture. Anything where posture is number one, you don't wanna go so heavy that you break down. So I recommend the 5K rep range. I do three to five sets. And that's an accessory. I wouldn't really make that a main movement. Uh, the overload, the main movements you want overload. You want strength to be the limiting factor. When you have one little piece that's missing, like stability, you don't want to make that a, a main mover. Uh, strict band rows, God, you could do as many of these as you want. You could do, I'd recommend five, even 10 sets. Band rows, you could, I mean, high reps, 10, 15, 20, as many reps as you want. The more bent rows, the better. I would say because the weight's gonna be a lot lighter here than with the good morning, you can get away with doing that twice a week. Your upper back will thank you. Um, you might not wanna do it uh, before any type of really substantial lower body work. Uh, the abdominal bracing stuff, I mean here you can do two to three times a week. You wanna do minimum three, but up to I'm sure six or more sets. You could do these, I mean, 30 seconds to I'd say a minute 30. You could even go higher than that if you're a sadist. But uh, those are just some generic rep and set recommendations. Camber bar, good mornings, you can go a bit heavier. So, I mean, I've done these for threes. You could even do them up for 10 plus reps, you know, depending on how you're using them. That's a good main mover because there's gonna be a lot of load. It takes your upper back away, so it puts all the movement, uh, sorry, all the, the, the pressure in your hips. It's just all about hip power. So that makes it a good main mover. So you can go heavy on those if you want. I would do a minimum of three sets, up to five or more. Um, again, once a week, because the overload's high. You know, when, when the load is high, when you're pushing the weight further, recovery is gonna take longer. So I wouldn't go more than once a week on those. Box squats are about the same. Uh, I'm less inclined to go higher up on a box squat. You can, there's nothing wrong with it. But I usually hit my box squat between three to five reps, you know, across a myriad of sets. Um, Side handle deadlift, same, same rule. We're all looking at, once we're, we're into the hip heavy uh, types of exercises, we're looking at load. You know, you're gonna be handling more load when you're isolating the hips versus the upper back. So, same rules apply, you know. Heavy, high rep, either or, once a week, three to five sets. Now, Romanians are in a little bit of a different category because uh, the load isn't as high. We're going back to uh, an emphasis on upper back. So these um, slower, higher rep, I mean, I rarely go under six reps. I mean, six at the lowest, 
but I've gone up to 15, um, going really, really slow, very, very controlled, and then explosive on the way up. And you know, this is just I mean, normal bodybuilding recommendations. And you could hit Romanians twice a week if you wanted. One's probably plenty enough, but you could recover from it a little bit faster. So if I was vague on anything, if you have any questions, any ideas on certain movements, and you wanna know, you know in what case they'd be appropriate to program, go ahead and leave it in the comments. And remember, take the bracing aspect seriously. This is the part that everybody just glosses over, right? Stability and coordination always comes before strength and power every time. All right, so until next time, this is Bromley at Empire Barbell.